Well, for those of us who remember to set our clocks back one hour last night, <clears throat> we're, here we are. It's now 9 a.m. Central Standard Time, and that means it's 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for those in the Philippines and other areas of the Eastern Hemisphere. So I'm really pleased for those who are up this late at night to join us in our studies. Uh, and I'm so happy to see the many of them have logged into our Zoom and so on and so forth, our Zoom uh, message. And so we're ready to begin and we will pick up with uh, the last couple verses of chapter 12 of Romans and then we'll pick up with chapter 13. <clears throat> so with that, I trust you've all prepared your hearts for the study of God's word. And in doing so, uh, if you're clean before the Lord, that the Holy Spirit can be your teacher and teach uh, truths that you may not have heard before or may have not have understood clearly before, and the Spirit will, uh, will make that available to us as we study. So with that, let's bow our heads in a brief word of prayer and we'll get started. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, you've given us life again today and now we've uh, set our clocks back another an hour this morning and as we uh, readjust to <clears throat> the taking away of daylight savings time, We've opted to spend our time this morning and this evening, as the case may be, in the Eastern Hemisphere, to feast on your word once again. And so thank you, Father, for your divine plan, your perfect plan, where we by, whereby we can grow into the likeness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which, of course, is your perfect plan for each and every one of us. So teach us again today. For your honor and glory, we gather in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. I <clears throat> told Nita last week, I have to, it takes a while to clear my throat. I should get up earlier and do some singing so my throat is cleared. But I didn't do that yet this morning. But anyway, <clears throat> it will clear as we move along. We spent last two sessions, I think it was, the last two Sundays in Romans 12. And last Sunday, um, we got near the end and just ran out of time. And so I want to, you know, by means of review, as we uh, come back to the book of Romans, as we finish it now uh, today, back beginning in verse 14 of Romans chapter 12, uh, Paul listed six descriptions of our love in the world. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Verse 17. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Verse 19, never take your own vengeance, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And then verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap burning coals upon his head. And it was that description of verse 20 where we had worked through that description a little bit and then we ran out of time. So I want to I go back to those notes regarding 
Romans chapter 12, verse 20. And we'll finish Romans 12 and then move on into chapter 13. The phrase, for in doing so, you will heap burning coals upon his head, is open to two interpretations. A figure... For the burning pain that occurs when hostility is hostility is paid repaid by love. Most who support this interpretation go to an Arab proverb that speaks of coals in the heart and fire in the liver as an extreme form of insult. Denny even goes so far as to say that this is the form of vengeance open to us to repay hostility with kindness and heap shame upon our persecutors. A second interpretation is more literal. In the ancient world, there were no such things as Zippo or Bic lighters or boxes of matches. The fire for cooking and heating the home was kept burning at all times. If the home fire went out, one would have to go to his neighbor with a pail to borrow coals. To heap coals means that enough hot coals are given so that some will still be burning when he arrived home to restart the fire. Upon the head may look at the way things were carried in the ancient oriental world in containers on the head. The second interpretation is more literal. The first interpretation, although it is subtle, hints of an attitude or motive of vengeance. If we have the mental attitude that we are really going to get to those who have hurt us by being kind to them, is not that revenge? It is still seeking just justice, only the justice is smothered over with sweetness, which I would see as a form of hypocrisy. It is as though the Christian is saying, well, I can't give hurt for hurt. I cannot repay evil with evil. So I'll get back at my enemies another way, by being kind and shaming them. So the mental attitude is still one of getting back, getting even. The method is just as different. The method is just different. So then we came to Romans 12, 21. Do not become overcome. Do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. And that was really where we, where we ended last week. We didn't get a chance to get through this verse 21 of Romans 12. In this concluding statement, Paul goes back to the imperative mood verbs of command. Overcome is the word nikau. It means to conquer, to prevail. Evil is the word kakos, something that is rotten, evil at its very source, regardless of how it may look or affect the moment. Sometimes evil is attractive and beautiful on the outside. Sometimes it may appear to be the expedient thing to do, even the right thing for the moment, but it is not. Good is the word agathos, the absolute good of God, or intrinsic good, not comparable to evil or even to other manifestations of that which is good by comparison. The only way to have this is to be yielded to God the Holy Spirit and to be 100% dependent upon the power and provision of God. So our principle then is this. We do not overcome evil by attacking evil, but by manifesting the good of spiritual and Christian love. We deal with the authentic to defeat the counterfeit plan of Satan. Let me illustrate. The people who are trained to recognize or spot counterfeit money are never shown counterfeit money. They never see it. The only money they ever see in their training is real, legitimate money. Their training consists only of spending hours and hours and hours focusing on 
and committing to memory what authentic, real money looks like. And when they're that trained, the moment someone they the moment they lay their eye on a false or a fake piece of money, they recognize it immediately. And what's the principle? The principle is the only way anyone can recognize false doctrine is by saturating their soul with sound doctrine. As I've said many times, and you've heard many times, if you do not know the truth, you will not recognize the lie. And my friends, that is what's happening in our nation and in many parts of the world today. So many people do not really know the truth. And therefore, they're not recognizing a lie and thus end up believing the lie. This last verse of Romans 12 provides an excellent introduction to the first part of Romans 13. Because in every age, there are Christians who want to go out and fight evil, especially evil in government. We have them today, Christian activists, but that is not God's solution to evil. So with that, let's close the book on Genesis or Romans 12 and pick up Romans 13. And I need to, I need to do a, a new share here, so let me get that up here. And let's see, here we are, Romans 13, we'll share that one. Okay. And now to get my notes. Over to the same over here. And here we go, Romans chapter 13. The introductory statement of Romans 13 is found in the last verse of Romans 12, which we just looked at. Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It is on that statement that Paul now writes about the Christian's relationship to human government. Your relationship, my relationship to human government as he opens up with Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority. Excuse me just a moment. I want to. No, that's not going to get it. Okay, that's all right. I had my cell phone. I thought I'd come into Facebook on that, but it's not working. So that's all right. Back to. Reading, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. The authorities that exist are established. That means they're allowed. God has allowed them to exist. Now, that doesn't mean they support God. <clears throat> that doesn't mean they are, they are good authorities or bad authorities or divine, whatever. But the fact of the matter is God has allowed those governments, those authorities to exist. Verse 2, therefore, he, you and I, whoever, who, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Verse 3, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is good, and you will have praise from that same authority. Verse 4, for that authority, it is a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it, the authority, does not bear the sword for nothing, but is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Verse 5, Wherefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, 
for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to the very thing. Verse 7, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Well, let's consider some principles regarding the good. The good, again, is agathos, the intrinsic absolute good of God. It cannot come out of evil. Romans 3.8. <clears throat> and why not say, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 8 of Romans 3. And why not say, as we are slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. Paul here ridicules the very thought that you can begin with evil and end up with good. The ends do not justify the means. This good cannot come out of the human nature. As he writes in Romans 7, 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. The heart of man is desperately wicked. The sin nature can produce a relative good, but not a good of absolute value. Isaiah 64, 6 is very clear about our attempt at doing good at the human level. As he writes in 64, 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take it away. Well, that pretty much sums up that the states clearly that our human good, our righteous deeds, what we might consider to be righteous deeds, are nothing in the eyes of God. Nothing but a filthy garment. And we've spoken, we've spoken about that filthy garment in the past. The source of this good is God. James 1, 17. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Let's consider some principles regarding the good. At salvation, God began a good work in us, according to Philippians 1, 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. When we were born again, when we became saved by faith alone in the person and work of Christ on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, we were created with the divine intention of producing good works. That was God's intention, <clears throat> according to Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The increase of this good in the believer is proportional to the amount of doctrine learned and applied. If you haven't learned it, you can't apply it. So you got to learn it. But learning it alone does not produce the good. You must apply what the truth that you've learned, according to Colossians 1.10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy, that means live in a way worthy of the Lord, to please him, that is the Lord, in all aspects, in every area of your life. We should be pleasing him, living in such a way that he is pleased, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Colossians 1.10. To Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul writes, All scripture inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Another principle, we are to take the opportunity to do good. We are to take the opportunity to do good, Galatians 6.10. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those who are of the household of God. And what's our opportunity? We woke up this morning. When you woke up this morning breathing, that means God is giving you opportunity. As we're living, we are living 
with opportunity to do good to all men. Next point, we can have production, which is good. We can have production, which is good. As John writes in his third epistle, verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Next, we can speak good to others. Ephesians 4.29 let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, that is building up according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Good produced leads to edification, to building up. Romans 15.2, let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Good allows us, it allows us to share with others. Ephesians 4, 28. Let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. Next point, only the believer has the opportunity to produce this good, and the ability to do so rests on doctrine, faith, and the free will decision to do so by yielding to God the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, 5. Does he then who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In Philemon, Philemon 1, 14, Paul there writes, But without your consent I did not want to do anything, that your goodness should not be as it were by compulsion, but of your own free will, as he writes to Philemon. And then, finally, to obey authority is good. Titus 3.1 Remind them, Paul writes to Titus, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Those on the Isle of Crete where Paul had left Titus. Which brings us back to how we can overcome evil. Not by rebellion, <clears throat> not by civil disobedience, not by revolution. The only way, by sticking with the plan of God and his good, and that good lived out in us. Our attitudes and our actions are to be defensive, not offensive, defensive, not offensive. We are to stick with the good of God to overcome the evil that is in the world and the evil that is promoted by Satan. The mandates for proper defensive action against the power of Satan are very important. As we read in Ephesians 4.27, do not give the devil any opportunity. And Ephesians 6.13, therefore, Take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and have done everything to stand firm. The evil day is the day of attack. The Roman soldier was able to get dressed for battle in a few minutes and be ready to defend himself. James writes in 4.7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he, the devil, will flee from you. Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, adversary the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. What God has provided in grace for our defensive action has no weaknesses. When we use our human strengths and abilities against Satan, we are defeated and overrun. Encouragement for defensive action against Satan is found in 1 John 4.4, 4, where we are told, Greater is he who is in you than he, that is Satan, who is in the world. And who's the he in us? Of course, it's the Spirit of God. It's Jesus himself living his life in and through us. 
The believer who gets involved in fighting evil in offensive action is distracted away from the truth of God. And there's the key. Let me, let me read that again. The believer who gets involved in fighting evil in offensive action is distracted away from the truth of God and the life that is to dependent to be dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's offer here some biblical background. In Israel during the time of Jeremiah, horrible things were going on at the Mount of Olives. Sexual sacrifice of pagan gods, child sacrifice. So Jeremiah, the prophet to Israel, wrote in Jeremiah 32, 35, and they built the high places of Baal. They are in the valley of Ben-Hinnon to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. These were the Jews who were practicing these things. But who solves the problem? Not the people, not believers, but God. As Jeremiah continues to verse 28 in chapter 32, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. The Lord Jesus Christ committed to the authority of the Roman government, although it was a government that was imposing totalitarian, totalitarian rule on Palestine and the Jews. His obedience was to the point of death on a Roman cross. In the epistles, we do not find any case of civil disobedience or offensive action taken against evil. And in the beginning decades of the spiritual body of Christ, in both Greece and the rest of the Roman Empire, there were social ills then, just as those social ills exist today. So what's the point? As Christians, it is not our responsibility to reform society to our standard. When we can legally and morally make a difference, we do. We're about to vote. We can legally and morally make a difference when we vote. It's sad when I'm hearing about the millions of Christians who simply refuse to vote because they don't like either candidate. That's, that scares me. Because voting is our legal and moral right whereby we can make a difference. We can run for office. We should vote. We express our position. But we do not disobey the governing authorities. Romans 13 is the Christian's relationship to government. Christian's relationship to government. Why does Paul turn from his statement of how to overcome evil to human government? Because so much evil is manifest in human government. A quick look at history is all that is needed to demonstrate this point. Romans 13, verse 1. Let's begin. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. God has established the orderly function of man on the earth and instituted human government as part of the laws of divine establishment that are applied to all mankind. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 13 and 17, Submit yourselves to the Lord's sake, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether to a king or the one as the one in authority, or to governors who sent as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil but use it as bond slaves to God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. In the creation of the human race, God established certain divine institutions, and then he added certain laws of divine establishment. Let's look at some of them. First, we have freedom 
in the garden. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So divine institution number one established in the garden is freedom. And that freedom was established by God giving Adam and Eve the freedom to choose. They could choose to obey him or they, could, they have the freedom to disobey him. Another divine institution is marriage. That too was established in the garden. Genesis 2, 22 to 24. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Third divine institution, family. Laws related to both in the garden family and out of the garden family. Genesis 1.28, in the garden. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then outside the garden, God again, with Noah and his sons, established family. When we read in Genesis 9.1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fourth divine institution, labor, employment, both in and out of the garden. In the garden, the command to work, Genesis 2.15, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and Keep it. That's in the garden. Out of the garden, we have Genesis 3.19. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground. Because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And finally, we have nationalism. And that ex exists out of the garden. Nationalism became the result of Genesis 11, 6-8. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us, the Godhead, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. And with that, we have nationalism. And I would say that there are many differences from nation to nation, but the most prominent difference from nation to nation is language. Each is established for orderly function and maximum freedom. Each of these divine institutions, freedom, marriage, family, labor, and nationalism, are established for orderly function and maximum freedom. All but one functioned even in perfect environment. Even family had the potential of function in that perfect sinless environment. However, one is necessitated by the presence of sin and evil after the fall, and that is human government, nationalism. We cannot, in this fallen world, get along without human government. And yet, human government is so often the source of abuse and evil. But we are called to a higher standard, a higher method of overcoming evil. Remain in the realm of the good of God. That's how we overcome evil. In verse 1, the phrase, be in subjection, is the present passive imperative of hupatasso. The passive voice indicates that we receive the ability to do this through faith in God's plan and the motivation of the Holy Spirit. The imperative makes this a command, not a only if you feel like it sometimes option. The word authority is huper eco, 
the word for delegated authority. And that is no authority, ex there is no authority except by God. We can, why can this be said? Because God is the absolute final sovereign authority and he has delegated the responsibility of human government to mankind. Well, question, does God ever interfere? Yes, he does. Nations were established as a result of God's interference in the affairs of human government. What was Nimrod doing at the Tower of Babel? He was trying to establish a totalitarian government. So God interfered and confounded the languages. The result, many nations. Another question, did God interfere with Israel? Yes, he did. Did God interfere with Rome? Yes, he did. Is he interfering with the USA? Yes, he is. Is he interfering with the Philippines? Yes, he is. So here's the point. God is in control. We are not. This means that in eternity past, God's total plan was set in place. Everything in history was played out exactly as it was placed in the computer of divine degrees, decrees in eternity past. And everything from today forward will play out exactly as it was placed in the computer of divine decrees in eternity past. There are no surprises. Oh, we might think there are, but there are none. There are no accidents. Nothing happens by accident. Nothing surprises God. He knew everything. He knows everything that's going to happen tomorrow in your life, my life, and everyone's life all the way to the end of human history. He knows it all. In the Philippine dialect, we would say, Walai manga disgracia. There is no such thing as a surprise in God's face. It might be us, and you know, but in God's, uh, in God's sight, there is no such thing. Romans 13, verse 2. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. The authority of verse 2 is the same as the authority of every, of verse 1, I should say, human government. To resist is the word antitasso. It's the opposite of submit. Tasso with the negative prefix ana is rather the upo to set oneself against, to range in battle. Anti Tasso, to set oneself against. This is actively going against authority. It is not a passive concept, but an active concept. If it was passive or a causal lack of submission due to ignorance, it would have been a simple ah prefix, which would negate submission but it is an anti-authority, not a, ah, but anti-tasso. To do this is the same as opposing the ordinance of God. The word ordinance is the word diatage, a singular dative of advantage. The single ordinance of God is recognition and respect for authority. The single ordinance of God is recognition and respect for authority. To resist is a rejection of authority. Whose authority? God's authority. The believer doing so receives condemnation from the government whose laws he or she is resisting and from God. The issue that comes out of this is civil disobedience. Let's consider a principle here. As Christians, we have available to us eternal solutions to man's temporal problems. However, most believers today are distracted from those eternal solutions and attempt to solve man's problems by temporal means. As Paul writes in Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to turn to the Bible and 
activism. There's a tremendous emphasis among evangelical Christians today to enter into activism, to practice social and political engineering. These attitudes and actions manifest the fact that most Christians do not understand that God is in control. And most Christians do not have a clue about the life of faith. <clears throat> Christian involvement is vigorous and often illegal activity to achieve political goals. And it's a manifestation of this arrogance in so many Christians. Christians stick their noses into other people's business. Christians intrude into the privacy of other people. Christians violate the constitutional rights of other people. Christians destroy property such as abortion clinics, pornographic shops. Activism within a nation is a terrible cancer. Christian activism is a sign of a distracted life. As Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 to 3, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Stop being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Satan is the sponsor of Christian activism, which is the believer involved in trying to improve the devil's world. This sees the Christian being involved in, a, in the temporal solutions to the problems of life when spiritual solutions are available. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. One of Satan's strategies is to get the believer involved in Christian activism. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, but I'm afraid lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. James writes in chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. A quote of Proverbs 3.34. Verse 7, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The resistance of the devil referred to here means to avoid Christian activism. Christian activism combines arrogance with legalism or self-righteous arrogance with crusader arrogance. Again, Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 6-9, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Activism finds the worldly Christian becoming humanistic in his philosophy. Therefore, in reversionism, he becomes occupied with temporal solutions. He advocates systems to improve man's environment rather than his relationship to God. Christian activism includes the social gospel, social engineering, social crusades related to moral degeneracy, civil disobedience, violence, destruction of property, and even revolution. Well, let's dig deeper into this idea of civil disobedience. <clears throat> With the question, when and where, if ever, is it legitimate? The evangelical Christian 
is becoming increasingly involved in civil disobedience. This is being done to the point of a major distraction from the advance in doctrine that should characterize the believer's life. When a Christian obligated to obey man's laws, and when, that's a question, when is a Christian obligated to obey man's laws? While there is no precedent in the Bible for civil disobedience, we also must see that there is a strong biblical mandate for ordinate obedience to man's laws. And we, we already read in the first five verses as we open this book, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive the condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it, the authority, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it, the authority, is necessary, we are, it is necessary for you and I to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. And again, we read earlier in 1 Peter chapter 2, and here's again, 13 to 17. Submit yourselves to the Lord for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king or to the one as one in authority, or to governors who as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of Christ, of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. The apostles make several important points in their message. Christians are to subject themselves to the governing authorities. Governing authorities, whether saved or unsaved, are appointed by God. Remember that Paul wrote this during the Roman rule of Nero. Resisting governing authorities is the same as resisting God and will bring discipline. The governing authorities are God's servants, even when they are atheist or pagan. God demonstrated that to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. However, the greater loyalty for the believer is to God's law, and when the two laws, God's and man's, are in conflict, we are to obey God's law. As Luke writes in chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Now here again, the greater loyalty for the believer is to God's law. And when the two laws, God's law and the laws of the authority, conflict, we are to obey God's law. Let's look at some examples of civil disobedience. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 to 21. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephirah, and the other was named Puah. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it is son, if it is a son, then you shall put him to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and let the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. The Pharaoh of Egypt made slaves of the people of Israel. 
Since Israel was growing in population while in Egypt to over 2 million people, the Pharaoh charged two Hebrew midwives with population control. This was government-sponsored Planned Parenthood. They were instructed to kill any male children and when they were born. Because the midwives feared God more than Pharaoh, they disobeyed the law and did not kill any male children. <clears throat> they were commanded by law to do something that violated God's law. And they disobeyed and even lied to the authorities regarding what they did. There are certain inalienable rights we have as human beings, life, liberty, and the ownership of property. These rights are given by God, not man, and present and present a higher law than that we are to follow. Joshua, another example, chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. First, we'll look at 1 to 6, and then verse 15. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot, whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, <clears throat> who have entered your house for they have come to search out the land. But the woman, Rahab, had taken the two men and hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went away. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax which she had laid in, the, in order on the roof. Verse 15, Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, so that she was living on the wall. Rahab of Jericho refused to give up the spies to Israel, who were hiding in her home and even lied to the authorities regarding their whereabouts. She protected the lives of the spies because she was following a higher law from God. Hebrews 11, verse 31, lists her as an Old Testament hero because she was a believer in Jehovah and chose to obey God rather than men. We read in Hebrews eleven thirty one, By faith Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. Had she told the whereabouts of the spies, they would have been killed and she would have been killed. Thus, the higher law of life enters in. The entire chapter of Daniel 3 is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they disobeyed the law of Nebuchadnezzar in refusing to bow down to an idol. They refused. This is an act of civil disobedience. But in doing so, they obeyed God. And note, they disobeyed that law, but did not resist the penalty that awaited them. They were thrown into a fiery furnace, but God protected them. They did not protect themselves. That's the story of Daniel chapter 3. Then we come to Daniel 6, 10 to 13. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now in his roof chamber he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction that any man who, who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days, is, it to be, is he to be cast, is to be cast into the lion's den? The king replied, that statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke about before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Daniel broke the law that said no one could pray or petition 
anyone but King Darius. He was caught, accused, and thrown into the lion's den. He disobeyed man and obeyed God, and God spared his life. Here's another one, the Magi of Matthew 2, 7 and 8. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and he determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. The wise men of Persia were ordered by Herod to report back to them when they found the Christ child. But they were warned by God in a dream not to obey the law of Herod. Herod was the king, and his orders carried the force of law and penalties for disobedience. They chose to obey God. Here's another one, Acts 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking about what we have heard and seen. Peter and John were taken before the Sanhedrin and were ordered to, to not preach the gospel of, or teach about Jesus Christ. Since Christ had commissioned them to do just that, they chose to obey God rather than man. Acts 16, about Paul and, and Philippi. We read through the book of Acts. We find in, in 16, verse 37, Paul and Philippi was thrown into jail and along with Silas, <clears throat> and after their miraculous release and the conversion of the jailer, they were ordered to leave town. You read all that story in Acts, 9, Acts 16, but they were, they were ordered to leave town. But what did they do? Instead, they staged a sit-in. Acts 16, 37. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us in public without trial, men who are Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now are they sending us away secretly? No, indeed. But let them come themselves and bring us out. But what is the issue? They were being forbidden to preach the gospel, and that was even a violation of Paul's rights of free speech as a Roman citizen. So he refused to get out of town to get out of town by sundown. Well, we've just looked at many examples of civil disobedience. Let's analyze what we've read. The scriptures provide examples of proper time and situations in which believers broke civil laws and royal edicts. In each case, the believer and a civil or royal authority are all who are involved, only two parties. The believer is being ordered by man's law to do something which violates God's law, and they chose to break man's law. No one else is involved. That's important. No one else was involved. In every case, the law at issue is very clearly a violation of God's higher law. Asked to murder babies. Asked to bow down to an idol ordered not to pray, commanded not to witness or preach the gospel and truth of Christ. There was no subjectivity involved, and each person could stand solidly upon clear scriptures that needed not extraneous interpretation or application. Civil disobedience today is taken by many Christians to involve a third party, the person they perceive as being harmed by that law. It is not a matter between the Christian and the governing authority. It is between someone else and then the Christian and then the government. Also, in current civil disobedience today, the laws that are in question are in question in the Bible also and are only laws that opposes God's law as perceived by the, these activists. The result is often that they break a clear law of God, a good law, and get involved in activity that clearly violates the word of God, such as murdering an abortion doctor. The biblical examples 
of civil disobedience would apply in a situation where the government attempted to deny you of your inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property. Part of those rights include the right to worship God and to obey the higher laws God has established for his people. If the government told us that we could not meet, we would meet. But the choice to do so would be between each believer and the Lord, not a third party demonstrating for our rights. In any case of civil disobedience, the one who chooses to break a law that is contrary to God's law must do so out of a personal, firm conviction from doctrine resident in their own soul, not out of the persuasion of others or out of peer pressure. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 4, 14, verse 5, one man regards one day above another and another regards every day alike. Let each man fully be fully convinced in his own mind. Christian involvement in political and social activity. As Christians, we are not to be we are to be responsible citizens. We are to obey laws and support the concept of authority and order. And we've read Romans 13, 1 to 5 twice and 1 Peter 2, 13 to 17 twice above. Any involvement we may desire to take on political or social issues must be within the law and within our rights and privileges as citizens. We must at all times bear in mind that this is the devil's world that man is influenced by systems of evil, and that things are going to get worse, not better. We are not, however, to be fatalistic and think that we can do nothing to improve our quality of life in our periphery. We can support honest laws of divine establishment oriented candidates. Those candidates that are that are living, that are honest and living according to the laws of divine establishment. We can help keep our city safe. We can support police department personnel. We can work to keep our city clean and our environment stable. But whenever any of these activities become a distraction to our primary purpose in life, we have stumbled in our spiritual walk and are setting aside the purpose for which we have been left on the face of the earth, which is to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We may enjoy, as an avocation, involvement in politics, economics, environmental concerns, PTA, school boards, city government, we can, we can enjoy being part of, of any of those. But when we get involved in those activities at the expense of Bible class, we are trying to function in the devil's world spiritually unarmed and ill-prepared. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 very clearly tells us where our focus should be as Christians. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, what's the principle? Do not be distracted from the truth. Paul writes in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do what you want to have. Do you want to have no fear of authority? 
then do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. In this verse, the ones who rule within a human system of government are in view. They are not a cause for fear for the one who is doing good works. Good here, of course, is agathos, as in Romans 12, 21. If we are about our business, we will be doing the good. And if so, we have no reason to fear. If the good of God conflicts with the authority of the ru rulers, we will have no reason for fear. Matthew 10, 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And then in Hebrews 13, 6, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I am not afraid. What shall man do to me? No reason to fear. Isaiah 41, 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. However, there are those who should fear, the ones who are involved in evil, and that can be extended to even those who are trying to overcome evil in any way other than through doing good. So let's continue then with verse 3. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. The way to avoid fearing authority is by doing what is the good. Again, with a definite article, and the same word we had in Romans 12, 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When we do the good of God, we can even expect in the future praise from authority. Paul says this in an interesting way. He uses a future tense, and with that shows that what is occurring in the present, and what's occurring in the present, the doing of the good of God, will result in praise from authority in the future. Now, since the ultimate authority is God, and all other authority is delegated, this praise may not come until we are face to face with God who is the ultimate authority. Verse 4. For it is a minister of God, it, the authority, that God has allowed. That authority is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. The New American Standard does a good job here. At the end of verse 3, a third-person feminine pronoun, same, meaning saved, autos is the word, means same, is used, and the antecedent is the word authority, a feminine noun. Now, in verse 4, we have a verb that assumes the pronoun he in the King James Version or it is in the NASB. The wording is a bit ambiguous, but the preferred rendering would be, as the NASB has it, it is referring to authority. It is referring to authority rather than to ruler. It is this authority that ministers to us, not the one, he or she, who is currently representing that authority but ministered to us for the good is authority. If we do evil instead of good, <clears throat> we should be afraid of authority. Authority bears the sword of punishment, and authority is the avenger who brings wrath upon the one doing evil. In the Old Testament, the word sword was used as a synonym for discipline. 
the sword removes the one doing evil in a society from society, either by incarceration or by capital punishment. Let's look at some principles regarding this authority. Responsibility requires function, and function requires authority to carry out the responsibilities. Authority can be abused, but God is in control and can and will intervene in the affairs of mankind on earth. Responsibility without authority is ineffective and frustrating. Authority without responsibility is despotism, tyranny. There are five basic things that every child must learn from his parents or church before he is launched into society. First, the principle of respect for authority. Every child must be taught this at home. I guarantee you the children who are out there not wanting to obey and live under the authority were not taught how to function under authority in the home. First must come authority of the word of God. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Next we have authority of God the Father. Deuteronomy 6.4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Then we have the authority of a pastor-teacher. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. We have Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you and considering the result of your conduct, imitate their faith. Again, speaking of the pastor teacher. Verse 17, obey your leaders that's Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. And then we have the authority of rulers of state under divine institution number five, nationalism. Genesis 9, God's instructions for Noah following the flood that had to do with nationalism. And then we have Romans 13, which is what we're studying now. Authority of a judge on the bench, local to national. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 8. Does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more matters of this life? If then you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. If it is so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between the brethren, but brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers? Actually then, it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? On the contrary, you yourselves wrong and defraud, and that your brethren. And then we have authority of parents under the institution of family. Genesis 4, chapters 4 through chapter 10. Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. And 2 Timothy 1, 1 to 5, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy 
for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your godmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. Well, I, it looks like I'm about, my clock says 10.15, so we'll stop with this whole idea of establishing authority, and we'll do some review of this and continue with our study of Romans chapter 13 next Sunday. Just an announcement before we pray. Um, uh, Nita and I will be back in uh, Little Rock, I think on the 22nd of November. And so I've contacted American Pie and they've given us permission to meet again on November 24. That's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So mark that in your calendars. For those of you in the Little Rock area, we'll gather again in American Pie on November 24, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. Uh, glorify yourself in our lives. Father, may we take these truths and not only live them in our own life, but to teach them to anyone that you give us opportunity to share these truths with. May we honor you, Father, in everything we think, say, and do, as you have given us the truths that we need to live a life that honors you and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, we'll be together again on Wednesday.